Steven Universe first aired 10 years ago. Isn't that good? Wait, no, let me start over. Steven Universe first aired 10 years ago, and I had no idea at the time that, like, chaos theory, this would be one of the reasons I'm a media critic today. It's strange to consider this, because I've never felt the need to discuss the show itself. I found it self-evidently good and rather explicit in what it encourages its audience to take away from it. And... This belief was further cemented when Sarah Zed did a couple of videos loosely related to the show. And yet, this goofy kid show about a boy with magic powers who loves his family and his home a whole bunch is something of my dark villain origin story, almost by no fault of its own. I am going to be talking about weird fandom stuff in this, unfortunately, but I want to make the point here and now. Steven Universe is an excellent show for children. And the internet fandom around it may have spent many, many years in hell, like most fandoms, but how it got there is an interesting story, and unpacking that needs us to start at the beginning. So, what is a Steven Universe? Steven Universe is a good kid show. Uh, I said that already. Uh, the show's super playful and vibrant with its animation and knows how to approach complicated emotional and interpersonal problems for a younger audience to connect with and understand. Yeah, that, that's uh, that's all I got. Uh, goodbye. Okay, uh, fine, I'll show my work. Uh, Steven Universe is built on the premise of evoking a sense of growing up. It's a coming-of-age story and a hero's journey, so that's why like season one has such a dreamy, easygoing pace. Steven is a child. He doesn't really grasp his powers, the weight of what he had inherited from his mother, the scope of his gem family, and importantly, he doesn't have a real grasp of the way the world works, both the magical gem stuff and just the nature of interpersonal conflict. Uh, this is why the tone of the show never spends too much time being too serious and plot-driven, for lack of a better term. At least not until the final season of the show, where, you know, they have to wrap everything up. Steven's failure to understand the nature of his powers is important to his development as a fighter and savior of the Earth, etc. But Steven struggling to understand why Lars is so bad at being honest with himself or with other people is also important because Steven is a kid who doesn't understand these things. The show constructs from the very first episode the basic understanding understanding of the gem's powers and how they cultivate them, and Steven's powers stem from his emotions, ergo, you get it. Rebecca Sugar is on record saying the show was made as a love letter to their younger brother, ergo, Steven's emotional development is tied to the story. His development also serves another more important purpose, one that, in the days of shows like Infinity Train, She-Ra, Owl House, good television inspired by Steven Universe, but that tends to have tighter plots, at least in the case of She-Ra and Infinity Train. I haven't watched Owl House. Uh, Steven Universe ends up being very patient with its storytelling. We're going to spend more time than I want talking about an infamous criticism of the show, a part of which accuses it of relying on filler episodes, episodes that don't advance the plot, but there's just not a lot of filler in the show. Like, it definitely has some, sure, usually around Ronaldo kind of loosely recapping things for us, but even episodes about supporting characters in Beach City help not only to give Steven a conflict to face, but also to help make the city feel richer and fuller, something that shows a lot of the beauty and passion and strangeness of the world that Rose Quartz fought to preserve. The show could, theoretically, be functional if it was always focused on the story of the Crystal Gems and we took the beauty and value of the Earth as a given, but that show would be a lesser version of itself. Also, at the start of the show, the Gems don't see the value and beauty of the Earth, and Steven helps them grow out of that position. Even Amethyst, the gem most connected to the planet of the trio, struggles to have a genuine appreciation of the Earth at the start of the show. Mostly the Gems are protecting the Earth out of obligation to Rose, and it is important important to foster that love of the world because as the character of Rose gets more complicated and ambiguous, we know that the principle she founded the Crystal Gems on remains meaningful regardless of the kind of person she was. While we're on the topic of Rose, uh, her character arc, something of a contentious point in the fandom, is designed to be complicated to go through, in part due to our lens through the show, a child who doesn't fully get how the world works, but also because Rose is gone at the start of the show. Everything we learn about her is through memories, stories, old videos. We can only see the parts of her that people remember. So her character doesn't always feel consistent because the story puts a lot of effort into using stories of Rose to expose biases in people recounting them. We see her as a murderous monster through Eyeball. We see her as a loving protector through Greg and Pearl. And we see her as a petulant child through the diamonds. 
ultimately, it feels silly for me to pick this award-winning show apart like I'm doing now, because more than any particular quality and detail it has that I'm a fan of, the strong character work, the show's focus on evoking the feeling of growing up, of childlike whimsy, of violence even, the show is just very tightly constructed. Episodes know when to be well-told, self-contained vignettes, or compelling bits of drama with tantalizing cliffhangers. If I had a particular complaint about it offhand, I'd say that the finale is more rushed than the rest of the show, and while the music is very good, very fun to listen to, as a matter of personal preference, it tends to be very literal music, lyrically speaking, which is useful and likely the correct choice to make for a kid's show, but outside of the one song I'll talk about later, the bulk of the music feels very on the nose relative to the topic at hand, and that isn't always my thing. Yes, I once covered the best song, It's Over, Isn't It, several years ago. No, I will not release the recording of it. All in all, I would say that Steven Universe fits the bill for what I'd call self-evidently good. It is not a very complicated show to understand, its intent is very clear and well executed, its flaws are typical of any show working around a major broadcasting network, and petty things like not liking Ronaldo or Mayor Dewey or the show's animation style aren't really the kind of criticisms that like warrant deeper cons consideration. Unfortunately, this kind of can't be a self-evidently good show, because there is an entire subculture of people who spent years of their lives being very extremely mad about this piece of children's entertainment. Oh boy. So, Steven Universe has a fandom problem, and while most fandoms are problems, this fandom is one populated by a good number of adults who like a show for kids, which is a particular kind of hell. Uh, Jenny Nicholson did a pretty extensive video on the brony culture going around My Little Pony Friendship is Magic, the, I want to say Gen 4 of the series? Bronies, keeping a short, were the adult male fans of the show and their involvement in the popularity and conversation around it is all very complicated and interesting, and you can watch Nicholson's video if you want to know more, but relevant to this conversation, she notes a shift in the fan reception of the show from it being seen as a kid's show that has a sense of humor that makes nods to grown-ups watching it with their kids, to a kid's show that's really secretly for grown-ups. A similar thing happened here with Steven Universe, and it's not even that hard to see why. The show had a great sense of intrigue and mystery, so while Steven is figuring things out, like why Petey feels like his father doesn't respect him, or why Kiki is having these horrible nightmares of being smothered by her sister, he's also learning about a cool space war between gems, beings with cool powers and bodies that can regenerate after otherwise fatal damage, and they summon cool weapons and can fuse together into bigger, cooler gems. On top of all the cool magical combat action is the show's queerness, with every gem except for Steven and his fusions using she, her pronouns, and getting into relationships with each other, coupled with Tumblr's popularity during the show's runtime. Do you remember pre-porn band Tumblr? Huh. The show was bait for a lot of people to get in there and make fan OCs and speculate wildly on the show. It was rewarding for a time, but as the audience started to grow out of the target demographic, as this really cool show for kids started to take on more adults fixating on it, with it came problems. At first, these problems were trivial, people wanting more out of Jasper, when she was kind of pushed aside a lot after her initial appearance in Fusion Prison with Lapis. People review bombed a Keystone Motel in Pennsylvania following an episode with the same name uh, for an augmented reality attempt at comedy, but things got weirder still when, beyond merely trying to piece together foreshadowing or trying to speculate on things like whether or not Garnet is a fusion or if Lion was made by Rose, uh, fans started to create their own interpretations on some elements of the show culminating in one of the more infamous pieces of fandom nonsense, the fusion as sex interpretation. So fusion in Steven Universe is when gems come together to fuse their physical forms into a bigger, stronger version, taking on new names and identities in the process. The crystal gems fuse with each other by dancing together, and in the case of Garnet, she exists as a fusion between Ruby and Sapphire, who love each other so much that they want to spend the rest of their life fused together. On top of this, Steven accidentally fuses with his best friend Connie, and the resulting fusion, Stevani, serves as a metaphor for their relationship. This emphasis on closeness and romantic feelings put a lot of people on the path of fusion being a one-to-one -one allegory for sex, for some reason. Ignoring the fact that fusion is a metaphor for trust and vulnerability, and sharing yourself with someone in a broader sense, uh, Pearl and Amethyst don't 
really seem to have a romantic relationship, and they all fuse together to form Alexandrite in order to fight particularly intense enemies. A group of fans made this decision that fusion is sex, and follows the same responsibilities and code of conduct that sex does. So when the episode where Pearl secretly manufactures a reason to keep fusing with Garnet happened, we entered the phantom hell of Steven Universe is a bad show because one of the characters is a literal rapist. This is a fun gem of the kind of fandom nightmare the show picked up because it is an interpretation not corroborated by the creators of the show, seemingly going far enough to have Steven fuse with his dad in the movie to point out that, of course, it's not a direct allegory for sex. Jesus Christ, Steven fuses with all the gems multiple times. He's a child. But because it was a popular thing on Tumblr at the time, they took this personal interpretation and hung it like a noose around the showrunner's neck, as though Rebecca Sugar were personally responsible for the finale where Steven does a sex sexual assault on all of the crystal gems. Paradoxically, by bringing very adult baggage to a show using pretty blunt metaphors to talk about flexibility, love, and trust, a lot of fan criticisms of the show end up feeling juvenile. The simple, clear point between Garnet and Pearl is that Pearl's personal insecurities and lack of self-worth are not things she can merely suppress because they will get agitated when she finds herself compared to Garnet. Being able to briefly live in a form with Garnet's self-confidence and power only worsens her own insecurities, culminating in her betraying that trust to desperately try to feel better. The show makes a point to directly compare Sardonyx, Garnet and Pearl, and Sugalite, Garnet and Amethyst, where the gem left out of the fusion feels unworthy of Garnet's strength. It cleverly uses the Sugalite example, which Amethyst feels insecure about still, to create a fuller understanding of the struggles she and Pearl both face. Wait, Garnet! You know, we're so much weaker than you. Fusing with you is like our one chance to feel stronger. Pearl feels weak, Amethyst feels unimportant, Garnet bears the burden of being depended on by them both, and for Pearl to use the thing that keeps Garnet together in order to cope with her pain is bad, is painful and a betrayal of a very precious trust that takes several episodes to finally start to unpack and get through. The simple construction of hurting someone you care about and having to work on yourself and mending that relationship gets swept away by a criticism that positions Pearl as wholly irredeemable in a way that is highly morally punitive. There can be no useful moral to be extracted for a younger audience about how to talk to someone you've hurt, because now it has to be a show teaching kids that sometimes adults will do horrible things that make them horrible people. How miserable. I wish that this were the extent of the strange criticisms laid at the show's feet, but there are many more running the gambit of completely nonsensical to the grotesque, and luckily, sort of, uh, most of them are compiled in an infamous bit of YouTube drama. I am talking, of course, about Lily Orchard's video, Steven Universe is Garbage, and here's why. Right out the gate, the problem in discussing Orchard's two hour long video is that it is almost infectious in how frustratingly wrong and mean-spirited it is. It's hard to find a place to start that doesn't end in me making a three hour long point by point takedown because she gets so many things wrong and it is so arrogant and confident in her wrong opinions, exemplified in the opening moments where she constructs a public that knows already that Steven Universe is a bad show and she's here merely to explain why we know this. It is alluring to meet that kind of belligerence and own her publicly. And many people have done that, especially as her work has started to branch out in complaining not just about kids' cartoons, but political YouTubers. This video in particular is her most viewed for sure, but also one that's been pretty thoroughly picked apart. However, since I already have you here and I wasted two hours of my life watching it, I do want to throw my two cents in the ring and point out that this video is pretty blatantly derivative of H. Bomber Guy's video, Sherlock is Garbage and Here's Why, which Sarah Zed also pointed out in her video, thanks Sarah, my job is harder now. But the amount of ripping off here goes pretty deep. H-Bomb's video centers uh, the showrunner Stephen Moffat as a critical piece in the puzzle that is why the BBC Sherlock is bad, in his opinion. And it goes into his career of making occasionally really good pilots or self-contained episodes of shows, but when he's in charge of a full narrative, be it on the show Jekyll, Doctor Who, or here with Sherlock, he falls into a familiar pattern of always alluding to something intriguing just around the corner, but consistently fails to land a satisfying conclusion. 
H-Bomb points to technical issues he has with the show, character choices, the weird amount of kind of sexist and homophobic content woven into it, and largely frames his argument around the idea that people really liked the first three seasons of the show and got upset about season four, and he's here to assert that it has always been bad and that audiences fell prey to Moffat's trick of promising deeper storytelling while never delivering. On top of all of this, H-Bomb makes a point that Moffat's direction with the show undermines what he claims as the heart and soul of good mystery stories by making the mysteries of each episode something that the audience gets very little chance to really participate in, instead often relying on Sherlock solving things off screen or just telling you the answer using information we never got. All of this is important to keep in mind because Orchard's video basically mimics this almost point for point. She insists that the core problem of the show is the showrunner Rebecca Sugar, insisting that they are to blame for all the filler episodes and their horrible timing with the myriad hiatuses the show went through, something that Lily Orchard insists that Sugar should have been able to predict and adapt the show to. She insists that the characters are bad, which, whatever, no accounting for taste, but does so in a way that positions her as an authority on not just a particular genre of storytelling, but storytelling in general, claiming that you can't run a story like Steven Universe because it's bad storytelling in some objective sense. She goes on to make a section accusing Sugar of racism, but we don't have to get into that. Lily Orchard does not stand by this section, which is good, because as someone who's hoping that if a race war happens, I'll just be taken out immediately, I'm hardly qualified to weigh in on it. Orchard accuses Sugar of being a pervert because of Stevani, and then, of course, the big one. We'll get to the big one. The temptation to go point by point here and refute this is strong, for sure, but ultimately it boils down to the same issue, and that is that Lily Orchard's online career is that of being a YouTube bully. An unenviable position, to be sure. This is far from the only popular thing that she's been a hater about. She got her start in My Little Pony content, if you can believe it. She's made an also pretty popular video decrying The Legend of Korra as being garbage, but I'm not gonna watch it. And yes, of course, she's gone deep into political YouTube drama, trying to pick fights with ContraPoints, Vosh, uh, Innuendo Studios for some reason? Uh, it's a bad career path to take here, and it has had the consequence of Orchard being kind of a target for a lot of weird harassment, and that complicated this video. She's been a victim of Kiwi Farms, the website used to dox and harass people, mostly trans people or cis women who talk about video games online, I guess, and that is pretty grim. She's wrong about Steven Universe, about writing, uh, probably also about Korra, and while it's been years since I've watched the show, anyone doomed to have been part of MLP discourse has already gone through enough. Whether or not you can find her nightmarish fanfic or whatever other nightmares going on with her, the point of internet bullying on the scale is to lock people into chasing moral justifications for why you have to keep on the attack. Much like someone locked into a confidence scam or a bigoted cult, you can find yourself grappling with a moral sunk cost. You have to keep finding a way to justify your behavior as righteous, or else you are a participant in a harassment campaign. So, we're going to shelve a moral examination of Lily Orchard's character. Her video has mostly been mocked and reviled, and no one seems to really be into her work these days anyway, so... Honestly, why bother bringing up fandom ghosts like this in this video? Well, because people ended up adopting her talking points anyway. The most infamous part of Orchard's video is the accusation that Rebecca Sugar has written something that could be read as fascist apologia. I'm trying to be very cautious with my words here because she's been very clear that she has never called Sugar a fascist or even a fascist apologist directly, and that is strictly speaking true, assuming of course that the implications of saying I wouldn't blame anyone for thinking she is a fascist apologist mean nothing. Do I think Rebecca Sugar is a fascist sympathizer? No. Do I blame anybody who comes to the conclusion that she is based on Steven Universe's content. No. It is a fascinating nightmare to unpack because this piece of discourse has persisted well past the video's legacy. And while it's probable that Orchard didn't invent this talking point, it does take center stage in a video with 8 million views. So she at least amplified its presence. So. I kind of want to die because I'm making another video about the internet at large having a severe blind spot on what fascism is. Truly, the specter of Three Houses discourse will never fully leave me. The accusation is as follows. Orchard et al. say that the diamonds, the gems at the top of gem society, are fascists because they do a genocide on living things and scoop planets out for their resources and move on. Steven is, at one point, given a tool that would shatter a gem, and he rejects it utterly. He doesn't want to kill people. Instead, he uses his powers, tied to his empathy, to get through to the diamonds and tucks them into reforming their ways. Now, 
critically, the diamonds aren't fascist. That isn't to say that what they were doing was ethical. It wasn't, and we'll unpack that in a moment, but fascism is constructed around an ideological enemy, an evil that compels all true citizens of a nation to become heroes and fight glorious battles against evil that is both easily slain and impossible to conquer. It is a narrative built out of an eternal struggle, one with an increasingly narrow definition of who is a true part of the in-group. This just fundamentally is not the diamonds or their society Please read Ur Fascism. Gem Society in the show is a powerful, overwhelming colonial power, but it is not locked in eternal struggle. After the final attack from the diamonds, the blast that shattered and corrupted all the gems on Earth, they figure that there was nothing left on the planet and the war was done. The Crystal Gems aren't a forever oppressed group that needs to be purged. They've spent the last 6,000 years going about their business and humans, organic life, don't register to their society as anything. I personally find it kind of sickening that the accusation is that Rebecca Sugar, a Jewish person, is out here writing apologia for space Nazis. But putting aside the explicit title of fascist, the diamonds have still been awful. In the real world, they've committed a ton of crimes. They shouldn't get to just be reformed. That's not how reality works. But have you considered that this is a kid's show? Well, yes. Obviously, Orchard has. She often cited this in her video as a bad defense, but I want to make this argument a little stronger than just going, it's for kids, you're not supposed to take it seriously. Orchard puts a pretty fair bit of weight on the kids part of that argument, constructing the idea that the argument is that it's not a mature piece of art, and we're supposed to look at obvious metaphors and politely ignore them because we have to treat it as though they're exempt from interpretation. That's a pretty easy argument to push back on. I get why it'd be tempting to make it that, but it isn't, is it? So one of the things that comes up in the lead up to the reveal that Rose Quartz is Pink Diamond is that Steven starts seeing visions as pink. Visions where he tries to get the diamond's attention, but can't, where they dismiss him, neglect him, fail to understand his wants, are tired of his enthusiasm and childishness, because it is drawing the comparison that the diamonds are his neglectful family. Steven, Pink, Rose made this discovery that they were wrong entirely about the nature of organic life, that what they're doing is wrong, and furthermore that the diamonds never bothered to see the results of their attack, the corruption they spread, and they will never listen to anyone else. The story here evokes the feeling of living in a family that doesn't just care to really know you or believe in your capacity to be mature and insightful and right about something they're not, and gives its audience the empowering fantasy of being able to actually talk to them, to actually push through their ignorance and imagine a family that actually could love you, who could actually admit that they were wrong. This is what is meant by it being a kid's show. It's evocative, it's an allegory. There is very little meaning to be extracted from a strict textual interpretation of a show that has, since the very beginning, framed itself around a world constructed to be wholly responsive to Stephen's heart. It's a show that cares about the transformative power of empathy, about interpersonal struggles, about healing and love. An adherence to all art as pure advocacy for the literal interpretation of the plot events sucks hard. It's looking at, uh, like, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 and saying that it's morally wrong that Gamora and Nebula come to be a family again because Nebula literally tried to kill her, missing the thematic heart of very simple art. And that, in particular, sucks a lot because very simple art is everywhere. It feels weird, digging this hard into criticisms of an award-winning kids show. It feels weird that people are this wound up about it in the first place. And that's by and large because the legacy of Steven Universe is everywhere. I, I'm not saying that Steven Universe is solely responsible for the mass production of family-friendly films, TV shows, and games dominating public space. That's honestly probably more the fault of Disney buying almost everything in the known world, so now everything is a mid-tier Pixar movie. There is a glut of popular art coming out that are all doing the Steven Universe trick and gently tucking kind of complex emotional tensions neatly into a story that's very digestible and well-produced, and as a complete pretentious queer, I'm tired of it. Art can be so much more than highly moral, highly instructive parables, but stepping even a little bit into abstraction, if you're a popular thing, a major motion picture, a AAA game, you're going to be subjected to endless, trite criticism about teaching bad morals. 
when I started this essay, I wanted to talk about the people who hate this show, of course. And I also wanted to talk about this fixation on art criticism that cannot move past the idea that all art is something that is here to teach you good morals. And I worried about how I could go all the way in one direction and then about face and go in the other direction. But the root cause of both is the same. You've likely heard the phrase, all art is political, which is strictly true, but is often misinterpreted. The common thread is the idea that by all art being political, all art is political propaganda, that every piece of art is advocating for an explicit moral position on the state of the world or how to be a person. By following this interpretation, everything starts to fall in place, right? Looking at Steven Universe in this strict lens could very much culminate in accusing it of authoritarian apologia. They still aren't Nazis, I'm sorry. But it misses that art is also deeply personal, and the act of expressing personal emotions can take liberties and can abstract things, and sometimes art is just complicated and weird and raises questions. Remember last month when I wrote about Echo? Do you think I went into the, that game to teach me a moral lesson? What I'm asking for ultimately is a fair assessment of this show and the curiosity to be more open and thoughtful in your relationship with art. Steven Universe, as I said up top, is a great kids show, and I mean that as a sincere compliment. The purpose of the show is to give a younger audience a compassionate moral framework to talk to friends, family, bullies, you know, kids stuff. It does this while giving nods to a more complex, mature adult world kind of outside the periphery of Stephen that he will on occasion be forced into, but banks on returning to the idea that no matter how bad things get for him, he has family and friends and loved ones who genuinely care about him, and critically, that Stephen loving others and loving himself are what pulls him through his worst trials. This idea is what creates the call and response between the last song in the show, Change Your Mind, and the song that has been underscoring the credits for the bulk of the run, Love Like You. The one song that feels genuinely disconnected from the show's otherwise pretty consistent, very literal songwriting. Love Like You has no clear speaker and is kind of wildly morose, speaking from the perspective of someone who loves, but does so in a way that's unhealthy. A love stemming from someone who doesn't love themselves. The arc that sets up, that culminates in Steven's final song, is one of maturity. The show saying that first and foremost, you have to love and respect yourself. And that act will pave the way to a better, more meaningful love with others. Even in, in the series' most melancholy part, Steven Universe Future, which owns up fully to the idea that Steven, now a teenager on the cusp of adulthood, has to face this complex world, has to face problems that he can't and shouldn't even try to fix, culminates in him losing control and feeling like a monster, only to end with an affirmation that no matter what, people love him and will always love him, even as, in the final episode, he drives away, leaving Beach City and traveling the world. This is good fiction for a young audience, and it should stay that way. The urge to make stories like this complicated and messed up and secretly for adults may very well mean that you're starving that your art diet craves something more complicated than kids shows teaching you that you can hurt someone and still be a good person. Maybe you should try playing Echo, I don't know. There is more to the world than this singular brush that popular art has been leaning heavily on. And maybe just like Steven, you too need to leave Beach City. Special thanks to Alexi Angelica, Bees the One, Caitlin Fisher, Colleen T, the William Cowley School of Management and Mindfulness, Gail Simmons, Joe Anderson, Lewis Wells, Lorez, Maria Aladren, Naraya the Redmarked, Nomadic Raven, Professor Bopper, St. Rawberry, Thomas Volpez, and Zetetic. Thank you all so much. <laughs>